Last week I shared a couple phrases with you that I want to review because we find ourselves in this Season of Change worship series, and here is the truth. There are some times when we choose the change. There are other times when the change chooses us. Sometimes we choose change. Sometimes change chooses us. One of the things that I didn't really point out last week, but I want to take notice of this week, is the pronouns. There's never a time where change that comes into our life happens on an island. Whenever we confront change or encounter a new challenge in our lives, those changes and challenges are surrounded by a group of people, some who are allies helping us navigate that change, some who will be antagonistic and undermine any kind of positive interaction we want to realize with that change. And so today, in this message, we want to focus our eyes and consider what it means to befriend change. To put around change and the challenges we encounter afresh, to put around those changes and challenges a social network of sorts. So that as we make our way through them, hopefully in some spiritually significant transformation, we're not going solo. We are not some kind of Christian lone rangers that have no tanto, no silver, nothing. We're just out there fending for ourselves. We started a couple weeks ago this Season of Change message series, and the goal of the Season of Change message series is simply this. It asks the question, how do you change? So often in church, we're called upon to repent, to be transformed, to change, but we never actually helpfully answer the question, how does change actually work? What do I, practically speaking, do every time a change or challenge comes in front of me and I want to embrace it and really get after it? What am I supposed to do? And so I've determined in this opening season of 2020, that we would use a secular book written by Carrie Patterson and Joseph Grenny in order for us to go back into Scripture and test the waters of God's Word and put those two things together, this secular psychology of change with a biblical word that gives us Holy Spirit, heavenly power, and then finally, to actually adopt practices and habits and rituals so that we can get after the change we're about. And so, uh, a couple weeks ago, over the past couple weeks, really, I've shown you this thing called the change matrix. And it puts change in three different categories. One is the individual motivation and skills that I have as I confront the changes that are confronting me. The social motivation and skills that are necessary in my social network of friends so that as I'm encountering change, they are helping me and being supportive of my goals and purposes that God is calling me forth to walk in. And then finally, next week, we're going to look at the environmental stuff, the structural things that have to happen in order for change to successfully stick, to be sustainable, and not just a fleeting moment of spiritual something. Today, we look at the social dimensions of change, and we ask the question, who is our peer group? Who is our peer group? And are they offering us pressure that is positive? or peer pressure that is negative. By the force of their numbers and their capabilities, do they have the skills and abilities to actually help us navigate change? Because here's one of the things that I've learned as a pastor. Having sat in many rooms of counseling, having walked with people through some of the darkest ways and experiences a human being could ever experience, when I'm counseling with people, when I'm trying to help them get through the next five minutes, if not the next day, the reality is, as I assess what is before me, there is one thing that will deprive me of hope faster than anything, and that is when I see that around this person or this life that is at tragic rock bottom, there is not a social network of support that they are essentially encountering some circumstance that probably has been brought on their life or a choice that they have made that has visited upon them a series of bad consequences when they are sitting before me essentially as life lone rangers. My wife would know. 
I come home, and that depresses me above everything else. I walked into a hospital room with Ethan in the bed, his family around him. Twelve hours earlier, he was brought into Washington University Medical Center unconscious, unresponsive, and near death. At 25 years old, his heroin addiction had taken over his life, and he had taken his last hit. At least that prior evening, that's what all the medical staff and the police that found him thought. You know, I, I, this is now meant to be funny, so that's serious. I'm now going to be just a little humorous here, appropriately so. I, I think I've told you this. When the senior pastor shows up from Concordia Kirkwood, you're dead. <laughs> it's a true statement. They don't send me out unless it's really that serious. It's better in some cases not to go. And when I walked into the room and Ethan saw me walk in, that's when the tears really started. Because that's when he realized, holy cow, Seidler's here. I must have been dead. His brother, his sister, both of whom I married, baptized their children, buried his father. They were in the room too. And the only hope he had were the three people, me being the fourth, in the room that day. In the weeks that followed, he would have to lean into them, but he would also have to make a much more courageous decision. And if you know anything about the pathology of addiction, you know that the most important decision he had to make was not to take the Norcan or, or, or go to counseling. Um, the most important decision he had to make in those following weeks was to shed the friends that had ushered him into the addiction in the first place. He had to change his peer group. His family had to step up in ways that they never had before. I met with him a few months back before I left Concordia Kirkwood. I was uh, in the middle of a day, and as it so often happens, God brought his name and that remembrance to my heart, and whenever God, by his Holy Spirit, prompts me, um, so often I try to react and respond to that because I don't take that as just a coincidence. And I called him up out of the blue and I said, hey, Ethan, uh, how are you doing? Let's get together for coffee. I'd love to find out how things are going. And as we sat drizzling over coffee and sharing conversation, I heard about his wife. I heard about the baby that was on the way. I heard about the new friends that he had adopted. What I heard essentially was his success story when he determined to change something, like so many addicts, he had all the motivation and truly, in many ways, all of the skills and abilities, the ability to grow in those skills and abilities as an individual, right before him, he had the counseling and everything else, but what he desperately needed and what by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ he had was a family and a church and a circle of friends and he shed the old friends that were no good for him, no good at all. That's why I say, in ministry, a Christian's primary peer group. As children of God, our primary circle of friends has to be constituted predominantly of Christians. Doesn't mean we're a cult. Doesn't mean we just hang out with believers like us. Jesus in the gospel I'm about to read, Matthew chapter 9, he was the kind of God that decided, you know what? I'll go hang out with tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. I have no problem doing that. But when push came to shove, he had a band of disciples. He had a group of followers to whom he had entrusted truly the care of his soul. The sociology that Jesus determined to have around him helped him confront the challenges and changes that faced him as the Son of God living in the sinful world, bearing the sins of this world on his sinless shoulders. No, we as Christians are called to hang out with people of all different stripes, varieties, and colors. 
But our primary peer group, if we are ever going to be successful and sustainable in the changes that we adopt, the repentance that we evidence in our lives as followers of God, if we are ever going to be successful, that primary peer group has got to be filled out with Christians. Christians not just in name, mind you, but in deed. Those Christians who are willing not only to cheer you on and who are motivated by you saying, you know what, I think God is calling me in this direction. And they pour into your life wisdom, and they pour into your life prayer, and they pour into your life, woohoo, keep going. But they also have the capacity to say, you know what, I'm going to learn a new technique. I'm going to learn a new skill or ability because I want to be not just someone who cheers you on from the, from the peanut gallery, I want to be a resource that you can use, and so I'm going to change in a small way so that you can realize your change in a big way. You know, when new members become uh, part of our shepherd congregation, it's an interesting little thing. You know the the most uh, repeated word that I hear from our new members? The most repeated word I hear from our new members is, is that they are looking for a church where they can make friends. How many of you were born and raised in Phoenix? Or let me put it this way. How many of you were not born and raised in Phoenix? Raise your hand. Like, hello, everybody. That's exactly right. When people entrust the care of their souls to this congregation, they want spiritual growth. They want word and sacrament ministry, perhaps. They want a place where they can pray, encounter God. They want all of those things. But here in this Phoenix community, one of the most important things we do is to be a church that shows lavish hospitality. And not just when they're coming in and as they're leaving, reminding them, hey, by the way, why don't you catch a donut hole? They're fresh this week. It's going to be fabulous. <laughs> No, no, they, they, as they're walking out, it's, it's the awkward, long convert, longer conversation to say, where are you from? What brought you here? Oh, I, I'm from there. I was over at the Fountain Hills Dog Park the other day with my nutcase dog named Toby, inappropriately behaving all through the dog park. Toby, <laughs> stop it. And as I'm sitting there with three other owners that are like shaking their heads, I'm like, wow, this guy's a mess. Wow, his dog is completely nutso. We pick up a conversation. It turns out all four of us are from Chicago. One from Highland Park, another from down in Elgin. And, and so we start picking up the conversation. You a Cubs fan? Yeah. You know, I mean, and this is what it's like. Of all the things we do, we're certainly going to succeed with the spiritual pieces of our ministry, the calling that God gives to us as a congregation. But we have to succeed. We have to be successful in being a church where people can come and get to know other folks. I am endeavoring to do that in this next season of ministry, and I need you to join me in that. And the very smallest way you can do it is just when you see somebody new. It's like when we were kids. And you're on vacation maybe with your mom and dad, or you went to the beach or, or the lake or something like that, and, and you see a whole bunch of other kids in the pool, you jump in, and all of a sudden you're best friends for a night. Hi, my name is so on and so forth, and hey, you want to play Marco Polo? I mean, it sounds silly, but we lose that capacity so quickly. And yet, you know from those memories with fast friends at camp or wherever, that that capacity is so critical, so critical. And especially for us guys. You know, if I have to hear one more time about how blessed a widow is after losing her husband because thank God she had a social network and the turmoil that enters into a guy's life after he loses his wife because that social network is not here, it, it, it makes me cry a thousand tears. We have, guys, we have got to retain the agility to just be friends. I mean, to go out on a golf course and just smack and kill a little white ball, you don't have to even talk with each other. Just say, you know, dumb golf jokes or whatever, but to be together. That was the joy of the Better Men series. I hope it's part of the joy of the Even Better Women series, is that ability to come together and to see guys young and old in our congregation just getting together, sharing a beer and talking and saying, hey, my name is. What do you do? How'd you get here? We have to keep that capacity sharp. 
Because when the day comes and the heat of the day gets intense, maybe in a hospital room, maybe just because it's been a tough week, the ability to interact change and to say, what is God calling me forward to to be more faithful? That is what is before us. I want to read you a lesson. If you just listen in. Jesus, you see, was walking along and it was the time when he began to realize this ministry was not going to be a solo act. He would be alone on the cross, but to get there was going to require a spiritual family. And as he was walking along, he saw a guy named Matthew. Matthew was there collecting money that he did not earn from people he did not know and really, frankly, probably didn't even like. And as Matthew was sitting there, Jesus saw him and said, Matthew, it's time for a change. Come follow me, he said, and be my follower, be my disciple. And so Matthew did that. And the interesting thing was, is that after Matthew did that, Jesus decided like a good Las Vegas better, I'm going to double down. I'm going to go hang out with a whole household of tax collectors and throw in a bunch of sinners with a good sprinkling of prostitutes. (laughs) And by the way, there were these religious leaders called the Pharisees. You remember the song, It's Not Fair, You See? And they said, hey, that's not fair, you see? We're the ones that you should be hanging out with. You're doing all these miracles. Don't spend it all on them. Come and hang out with us. And Jesus looks at them and says, Hello. You've not gotten the message from the Old Testament you presume to know so well. Jesus said, Learn this verse. I desire mercy, not your quibbling sacrifices. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. And I have come not to call the righteous, to call you guys. I've come to call the unrighteous and those who know that they are really sinners. When Jesus constituted his church, he brought together a people from many different walks of life who would hold a common faith in who he was and is and what he has done the cross and the empty tomb, and that common faith would make them truly friends. And everything else in this world that separated them and kept them formerly at a distance would be obliterated. And the church of Jesus Christ would be constituted, and it would be constituted predominantly of those who call on the matchless name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they would learn in that faith to become friends. Shepherd of the desert, we need to learn in the context of this faith how to make new friends. And if you become accustomed to sitting next to old friends, that would be not old friends age-wise, that would be familiar friends, by the way, just a clarifying point on that because I won't be in trouble or fired this week. So if you become accustomed to older friends, that's great. But the church is evaluated by the Lord Christ Not by how well we maintain friendships, but how agile we are in welcoming and maintaining new ones. That's what this church endeavors to do. And as I started last week's message, I want to end this week's message by reminding you that this church is anchored to the identity of Jesus. He is the one who gives us the power to change, It is the word of Scripture that gives us the constant invitation to change. The social network that the book Change Anything imagines is expressed as the strongest of social networks when the faith of Jesus is at the center of it. You see, it's not just the psychology of change we're learning through a book. It's the spirituality of change that Scripture has been teaching for thousands of years that is what we want to learn today and what we want to commit to. And it begins by calling on Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior.
saying yes to that relationship with the friend that God in heaven sent for you. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Make him your friend. Or more appropriately, receive the friendship he is freely offering you. Friends, we've got a lot to do here at this church. And in the weeks and months and years to come, I hope that one of the things that we are known for is the faith of Jesus we hold. But in some ways, even on top of that, this truth, we are the friend, Leah's church, there is in the valley. <laughs> Not because we want simple and syrupy hospitality to mark us, because we realize, rather, that lavish hospitality and a spirit of true and holy welcome is a mark of the true Christian church. And this congregation will be evidence of that true Christian church. Amen? Amen. Amen.